Okay, so today I'm going to introduce uh, the analytical equations used to uh, analyze the impedance spectroscopy data uh, once you collect it using the method I uh, described in the earlier uh, sections. <coughs> so, for the first question now is what is impedance? So, we're probably all familiar with uh, voltage, current, and resistance. And as we know, voltage equals current times resistance. So impedance is sort of to resistance as AC is to DC. So in the DC case, uh, in the DC case, we have uh, resistance blocking our circuit blocking our uh, you know our current from flowing through the system and in the <coughs> AC case we also have a sort of type of resistance so if we apply a voltage to a circuit we expect a current response but because when we are you know let's say we're applying a voltage to a black box circuit here Let's just make it in a new slide. So we're applying voltage. You know, let's say we have some function generator, which is going to be attached to ground, and we have this hooked up here, and we have this attached to ground, and we have some type of circuit in here with a certain type of impedance. So if we apply a voltage, a sinusoidal voltage amplitude, we're going to get a current sinusoidal response with some type of phase lag <coughs> and we'll denote these amplitudes as IO and VO so if we directly take these amplitudes VO and IO it gives us the absolute value of the impedance because sort of it's the, sort of the same case where we have voltage and current but in a DC case we would have resistance so these two uh, ideas uh, provide the same analogy uh, with AC and DC. So obviously our piezoelectric material has a responding current and therefore uh, this then allows us to measure <coughs> those parameters. So in another way we can also measure it using the RMS voltage uh, and the RMS current and the RMS is a root mean squared and you can look that up online what that means but essentially for a sinusoidal uh, output or a sinusoidal wave the RMS value equals the amplitude uh, divided by square root of 2 <coughs> uh, so this can give you the uh, RMS value so the thing about the special uh, characteristic about impedance is that it both it has an imaginary and a real part. So before, as you saw, I was just mentioning the uh, I was mentioning impedance as an absolute value. So impedance actually it carries a real and imaginary part. So if you were going to describe the impedance correctly, we would say it's a star or not correctly, just in a very clear term, we would say it has some imaginary value plus a real component. And the phase of these two, you know, we'd have a real and we'd have an imaginary uh, axis. The phase of the uh, magnitude of the imaginary impedance and the real impedance then gives us the phase of the response. So we think back to this case right here. Either you can represent your impedance in a real and imaginary uh, contributions or what you can do you can say you have a absolute impedance with a phase and these two representations are equivalent <coughs> and they tell us the same information they tell us what is the phase you know from this you would have to take the tangent to get the phase and they tell us what is the absolute value so if you have the real and imaginary obviously we know how to take amplitudes right with with a vector quantity you take the square root of the addition of the square of each of the values so what is real impedance 
and what is imaginary impedance? Real impedance, <coughs> uh, real impedance is like a resistor, and it corresponds to losses, because the <coughs> the AC response of a resistor is at phase with the uh, with the voltage uh, input. So the, the 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 current over a resistor is always in phase with the voltage applied. Therefore, the uh, the phase, you know, over here for a resistor, we would just have a single flat line here representing the impedance. So the impedance of a resistor is always equal to the resistor value itself for ideal resistors. And this would then be equal to the uh, absolute impedance because the imaginary impedance is zero. So the imaginary part can correspond to either capacitance type of an effect or an inductance type of effect. So, if the imaginary impedance is positive, then we have an inductance uh, type of circuit. And if the imaginary impedance is negative, then we have a capacitor. And this then determines the phase. So, for a VI positive phase, that means voltage, is, uh, the current is ahead of the voltage, then this would, meet, this would be the characteristic of an inductor. And if the voltage is behind, <coughs> um, voltage is in front of the current, and this is the uh, behavior of a capacitor. So depending on our uh, real impedance, our imaginary impedance, uh, we can calculate an absolute impedance, and we can also ca calculate a phase. So, but however, absolute impedance, mainly for piezoelectric electric materials, is what we're going to be analyzing and uh, considering in most detail. You can also consider the admittance which is 1 over the impedance, which is donated by Y. It'll also have a phase, it'll also have a real part, it'll also have an imaginary part. Um, it can be analyzed in much of the same way. Most of the time we're measuring impedance from an impedance analyzer, an LCR meter, but you don't have to limit yourself to that. Uh, you know, impedance is what? Impedance is voltage applied and current, which comes out, a current which results. So if you can measure the phase, you can measure the <coughs> you can measure the amplitudes of each one. You can then measure the absolute impedance by measuring the uh, voltage RMS value and the current RMS value. So you can also um, get this value by measuring it directly. But there's also a lot of different challenges uh, uh, by measuring it correctly. It's much easier to use a commercial instrument such as an impedance analyzer and LCR meter uh, to figure all of this for, uh, for you with good accuracy and less chance for error. So this is an example of the impedance of a piezoelectric resonator not shown too clearly uh, but we'll try to clarify that a little bit now. Uh, this plot right here as you see me tracing this is the impedance and we're going to be drawing this here these axes is right there this axis is frequency in Hertz and this is an impedance of 10 ohms 100 ohms so this is a logarithmic and this is a hundred thousand or I think this I think it's ten hundred thousand And here we have, on the other side, we have phase, which I'm going to draw in now in a different, a different color. Phase. And the phase goes between negative 90 and 90. <coughs> and, it, and it begins at a low, 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 frequent, low phase value, which is the uh, capacitive type of behavior of Peel's electric material, in between resonance and anti-resonance. So here we have the resonance frequency. We're just going to call that FA. Uh, the resonance frequency is called FA. Or we can call it FR. I think throughout my, 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 my uh, uh, instructional video here, we're calling uh, the uh, resonance frequency FR, and we're calling the anti-resonance frequency F anti. And just to make it clear, there are a lot of different types of uh, ways you can describe it, notations. Uh, but here's some of the easier ones. FR and F anti. So before uh, the piezoelectric material reaches a, a resonance frequency, it behaves like a capacitor. 
<coughs> as I mentioned uh, in many other lectures. So it has a negative 90 degree phase. We can measure, therefore, we can measure the capacitance of the, <coughs> of the material here and also have a uh, close to negative 90 phase, which also uh, demonstrates capacitive-like behavior. In between resonance and anti-resonance, uh, for the reasons that I showed uh, in another instructional video, we get a positive 90 phase. So volt, so current is ahead of voltage, sort of like an inductor. And then after their anti-resonance frequency, uh, we get, again, a lowering of this uh, impedance. Impedance will go back down. So if you were to extend this graph, you were to see this type of behavior. We were to see that um, the uh, the capacitance, if, if the capacitance uh, value would remain the same, and the resonance and anti-resonance frequencies were not to exist, you know, the resonance phenomenon did not exist, the uh, capacitance would behave like this. The impedance would just continue uh, like a capacitor. And how does a capacitor react? with frequency if you assume this is the absolute impedance and this is the frequency the capacitor would just decrease its free, uh, impedance as increased frequency so at frequencies above the anti-resonance frequency and below the resonance frequency uh, we have capacitive like behavior uh, in between here at these points we have different interactions occurring in the material due to the resonance uh, effect and due to the resonance effect reacting with the built-in capacitance of the material. Uh, it's also very very important to note here, and I'll just erase some of this, that all of the materials don't have such a nice response that you can <coughs> that you can easily measure like this. So some of the materials they have a more broad they have a broadened effect here. So they may look like this. And the the features may not be so clear. Also, for example, the phase. In this case it goes from negative 90 to 90 pretty closely. Uh, but however, you may find in some materials, and this is a zero point. Uh, right. Uh, this is a zero point right here. You may you may find that the phase doesn't even become positive. So these are some different challenges uh, for different materials, which I won't be mentioning in this video. Uh, but realize that these difficulties exist for some uh, measurements and some materials. Uh, so don't be surprised if you don't get a perfect response that's so easy to analyze. In that case, red's a red flag and you have to use some different type of methodology, which I may cover in the future.